Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word. Help us to move all of our cares and worries uh, away and aside for the time being to be with you, to be with your Holy Spirit, to be with the word of God. I just thank you for this uh, great honor and gift that we have in this country that we can still meet together to, um, to investigate um, the decisions of believers um, throughout this time and compare them with our own that we may understand the vulnerabilities of, of uh, the path to spiritual maturity and will not take these things for granted. I ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <clears throat> so we are covering the church in Thyatira, Revelation 2, 18-29. This is the fourth one we covered. And, hmm, honey, would you... Uh, yeah, get you some water. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Well, that was awful magic. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so prepared. So remember a little bit about Thyatira. It, it actually means uh, continual worship, and not, in, not in the Christian sense either. So um, we know in, on, on the seven churches, if, you, um, if you're just looking at the map, where Ephesus is the first one, you, it, it goes, this would be the fourth one, so it would be Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. And remember the seven churches are, are done in a clockwork in the clock area. And they're all these all seem to be about 40, 50 miles apart. <clears throat> and if you remember one of the associations here, we'll get to get to it, is um, that with Jezebel. And if you remember we covered Jezebel probably three weeks ago, four weeks ago, four weeks ago now, where we were covering Ahab and Jezebel and uh, who she is, and she's the um, our Sardonian uh, princess who was the was the one for the worship of Baal. In Sardon, I, think I have that down here somewhere. Yeah, down here. And um, and she was she was she was actually the evil that influenced um, Ahab. And there's a principle that we're going to run into, and it's a really important one to be aware of. Is that it's a principle I wrote over here. Is that you will find in very common is that the weaker person will control the stronger person. Okay. And this is very common. And a lot of times that happens is because the stronger person will, um, will have integrity. And, and, and they will not always have integrity, but they will be such a person that, generally speaking, they will not go places that weaker people will. And since I know who the group we is, you, you find this happening with conservatives and liberals. You, you find liberals controlling conservatives because liberals will not stop at anything. There's no low bar for them. And um, with, with uh, conservatives, generally speaking, there is things that they will not do. They, they fall out of their morality and out of their character. So you see it very commonly where you see, even in the media, where you see these psychopathic media liberal type people who are controlling a lot of other people who will not speak, even though they have a higher integrity, uh, they will not speak uh, because there are things that they will not get into, which is like this little bickering match of name calling that is very common. So it's a principle that you see, and the reason I brought it up was not that particular one, but it's one that we see very common. You see it in husbands and wives, and uh, you see it uh, in that dynamics very commonly. You see it in leadership sometimes where the weaker of the two uh, will control either up or down um, because of the integrity of the person who's above them. And it, it, we don't think about that with Ahab, but Ahab and Jezebel, but in reality Ahab didn't have much integrity, but he had a lot more than Jezebel. And you see this little hundred pound uh, princess controlling Ahab, and, and, and I think we mentioned it where we were in Ahab, is that um, he, um, he actually was, a, was a, an incredible warrior. He won almost all of his victories, and uh, he, was a, he was a great general, and things like that. And here you have this man who is very powerful and has the ability to control his troops and has all this discipline, yet this little 100-pound uh, Jezebel uh, controls him uh, in major ways. We see a very a similar dynamic, and we'll bring it when we get to it, between Jezebel and the pastor of Thyatira. So let's read uh, verse 18. He says, And the angel of the church of Thyatira, we know that's not angel, that actually is referring to the pastor, 
These are the words the Son of God, whose eyes are blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. And we covered this when we were covering this uh, chapter in uh, Revelation. That you know, the blazing fire is divine just judgment. So that's what it's displaying here. And um, burnished bronze. Is, is national judgment, usually a group judgment of some sort. So you see him introducing himself as the judger, you know, as a discipliner. And that's very specific to the Church of Thyatira. So in 19, this is the only positive page, well, this is, this is the positive page here, and it says, I know your deeds, meaning Christ knows their deeds, and these deeds here are the... Uh, uh, works of uh, Agathos, or they're, they're works of, of divine, um, right here, they're works, they're works of divine significance, they're divine works there, that we use the word Agathos. It says, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Now, that, that doesn't make as much sense as it does, so let me read the translation. It says, I have known your accomplishments, Christian production, Okay, so he's talking to a very specific people in, in this church. He's addressing them first. Uh, namely, the love, and this is talking about virtue love. Okay, this is uh, agape love, which we uh, have up here. Agape love. Agape love is an impersonal love. Okay, this is the kind that is required when Christ says to love one another. It's talking about an impersonal love. It's not, um, it's not talking about a personal love. And I think you guys all remember... Um, the dynamics of that is that an impersonal love comes from the integrity of the person and is given out to somebody maybe who doesn't even have integrity. It's a diplomatic love. An example of the greatest example of that is John 3.16, where God so loved the world. Um, the world's not lovable, it has nothing to love. It's an impersonal love of God that, that God has because of his integrity. And it's the same thing with Christian love, is that it is the, in the integrity of Christ that we love people even though they are not lovable, even though they do not deserve it. We still do it um, because of who Christ is in us, and it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it says, and faith. And this faith is one of the times we run into where faith is faith, okay? It's, uh, usually we talk about it as Bible doctrine, but in this case, this is, a, this is what is sometimes called, we've heard it called, a theme calls it faith, faith rest drill. And it's a, it's a dynamic where you, when you, um, when you have a struggle uh, or something happens, you, you take a step back and you claim a promise that God has given you that you know from Bible doctrine. And then you doctrinally or rationalize that, which means that when you, when you have something that, that happens that um, it can be challenging, can be overwhelming, can be a death, can be all kinds of stuff. We had some of that stuff this this last weekend, and this is and this is the this is what we went through. You know, we claim the promise because we know where uh, mom's at. You know, we doctrinally oriented ourselves. She's with she's with Christ, and she's with Dad. And then we chose that doctrinal orientation, and we came to a doctrinal conclusion. Therefore, comforting ourselves and divinely uh, orienting ourselves through this technique. Okay, so that's where faith fits. Um, the next piece here says, and the ministry, um, and this is, the, the ministry here is a function of our royal priesthood, of our ambassadorship, okay, we'll get to it in a second when we look at the word, and your perseverance, um, and this perseverance is this piece here, where the perseverance is in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the plan of God, and following the protocol of God. You persevere in that. So if you can see, these are, these are this is almost a cookbook recipe of how to live a, um, a Christian life. And, hey, what does that? Um, so this is the dynamics of it. This is what we saw. When it's persevering, why is persevering important? It's important because it is, it is the protocol that the Christian has to use as self-control to follow. Because sometimes when something happens, it takes you back. And um, you have to orient yourself so that your viewpoint is not a um, human viewpoint, the divine viewpoint. So these are some of the things that we're seeing, even in the book of Philippians, repeated here for the uh, positive review part 
of the Church of, uh, of, the church of Thyatira. And it says, and the last piece here is, is, is a better, um, if you read the first top one, because the guy doesn't translate the word right, he, he doesn't translate the actual words, the words that are actually there, it says, and your last word, the word is eschatos, your last works are greater than your first. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, uh, your last works are greater than your first means that when you were, when you were fir your first part, See, last is greater than first, is that this is your immaturity when you first become saved, when you're a young Christian. And so what happens is as you mature, your works, your Christian works, are greater than your first ones. It's, it's a, it's a uh, in essence, it is showing them that they are maturing. The people that it's talking to in this verse, these are the maturing ones. Okay, and these are the ones that are all the positive things that Christ says. And this is what our goal is, is that if you do not mature and know Bible doctrine, your works, Christian works, will not be greater than your first ones. They will be less because the, we know the path is that when you are first saved as a believer, if you do not have Bible doctrine, um, if you do not have Bible doctrine, which takes you to divine plan, what do you have? You have human viewpoint, right? You have human viewpoint. And what do you do? You act like other people. You act like un uh, unbelievers. Okay? You act like them. You're saved, but you act like it. Why? Because you are minus Bible doctrine. You have no orientation. The only orientation you have is human viewpoint. Okay? That's all you have. So you act from that. Whenever you wonder why, and, and, and we know this because when you see a, a, an immature believer when they're first saved, they're, they're dumb, okay? They, they, they don't know anything. In reality, um, they're saved, okay? They're saved forever, but how can they do the works of God if they do not know what God wants from them? If they do not know the protocol? If they do not know that being filled with the Spirit is a critical part of the protocol of God? How do, they, how do they find their compass to do what God wants them to do if they don't have Bible doctrine? They don't, okay? So what happens is that their works, when they were saved, actually become less, okay? So this would be, the, for them, their last works would be less than their first works because they do everything from human viewpoint because that's all they have, okay? This part here is a part that maturity goes the other way. The last part, which is over here, is greater than the first part. So that's what that means. A, a, a direct translation would have gone a long ways to straighten out what he's talking about here and make it clear. So we talked about agape love being integrity. Um, in, integrity of uh, the same integrity of God which we have with the filling of the Holy Spirit. We talked about faith. The other word we talked about was the word service. And this is actually the word that we use for deacon. Uh, it's uh, dinakania. Okay? Uh, it's like the word deacon except N-I-A on the end of it. And, and a K. And what it means is it means uh, administration. It means ministry. It means that you've made your spiritual gift operational. Okay? That's what that means. That's, that's how they achieve that. Your service to your Christian works has become operational through those gifts. Okay? And then the last word there is, is patience, endurance, and it means that you have, uh, in order, let me see, in order to, um, in order to function to produce divine works, okay? See that. You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to have direction, Bible doctrine, and in that you have to positively choose God. And what does that do? It produces divine works. Okay? So if you if you don't have this, if you don't have the filling of the Holy Spirit, you don't have the power of God, and you are disqualified from any divine works. And if you do not have the Word of God as your orienting part of your soul, you do not go in the right direction. You may be nice and sweet, 
But what you will not be is doctrinal. You will not be on God's plan. Okay? Because you won't know which way is which. And that's what he's talking about. So what he's saying here is that you need to persevere in here. This is where you persevere. You persevere that this is, the, this is what you need to do. Grow your doctrine, be filled with the Spirit, and be positive. Okay? And this right here, we know there's lots of stuff to, to Bible doctrine. There's lots of cleaning up and exchanging. Remember the matrix we had? There's lots of exchanging of human viewpoint for divine viewpoint. The biggest problem in Christianity today is, is, the, is the fact that the Christians hold a divine, have a human viewpoint rather than a divine viewpoint. And we'll see that's a key thing as we come down into this next piece here where, we, um, where we're looking at what happened, okay? So, let's go to the next page. Um, I do want to say something while I'm thinking about it, because I don't have it in the lesson, is that um, one of the things I want to make sure is that many times what God is doing with us, when you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit and you know the Word of God, you give the Holy Spirit... Um, enough ammunition, I'll call it ammunition, that's not what I mean, you'll give him enough to work with in your soul to be able to compare the things that happen in your mentality when, you're, when you have a bad attitude. See, if, if you don't think an attitude is an issue, you will never deal with it. And there's lots of Christians who have, who have horrible attitudes, and they are an ambassador of self, but not an ambassador of Christ. The problem is they go to church and they call themselves Christians, so most people assume Christians can be complete jerks. But that's not the purpose of it. The reason they do that is because they don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, they don't have the Word of God working on it day and night, and what the Holy Spirit's trying to do is He's trying to make you more like Christ. And it's not that you cannot do divine works um, and still have... Um, attitude issues or have personality flaws, you can. But God's purpose in, in that is to clean those things up so that you are happy and you are best, you're, you're your best person to be more Christ-like. Does that make sense? So when God is trying to show you something, He's not trying to just slap you around because, um, because you're an idiot. He's, trying to, he's actually trying to do that to make you happy. Okay? To make you... Uh, pure, to make your motives right, to, to enjoy that happiness and blessing both on your side. God can still use people, okay? We know, he, he, we, we know that He can, but in reality, He is doing that. He is doing a, a, a work in you to make you more Christ-like so that your work in the world is one of Christ through you. So, so now we go to verse 20, and this is, where the, this is the bad side. Okay. He says, nevertheless, I, that's Jesus Christ, have this against you. He says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. A prophet. Her teaching, she misleads my servant into sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. The translation on this one says, and if you have your old notes, you'll, you can just follow this. He says, but I have this fact against you, namely that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Now, we know her real name is not Jezebel. Uh, Jesus is making the comparison to the evil that she is doing, the comparison to, to Ahab uh, and which, how she changes that and how she changes the nation. And she actually changes the nation, if you remember, to be one of idolaters to having Asherah and Baal. Okay, So this is very similar to what she's doing in the church in Thyatira. Okay, so that's why he uses that. Who calls herself a prophetess? Um, just to let you know, there is no such thing as a prophetess in the in the church age. Is there even a prophet? There's no prophets either. Yeah, there are people who had to get the prophecy, but they all ended with the uh, with the last piece of the scripture um, being being John, because he was obviously a prophet, as he gave prophecy. But he was the last one. The apostles were the last ones with those gifts. Um, she teaches, and this is, note these words, she teaches, okay? And she seduces, which means to be led astray. Uh, how does she do that? 
she, and that's one of the issues right here, is she leads them to the doctrine of demons, okay? Um, which is, uh, which you, the, one of the problems with Christianity is you think that the doctrine of demons is um, some kind of, um, what's the word? Sinister. Yeah, sinister, that's the good, yeah, sinister's word, you think it's a sinister thing. But what happens is many times the doctrine of demons is a very nice thing from a human point of view. How do we know that? Because we know that Satan is called what? The angel of light. The angel of light. Yeah, the angel of light. So it tells you that when, a, when Satan is acting like the angel of light, he sounds like the nicest person you've ever run into, enlightened, kind, sweet, why wouldn't you listen to this guy? Okay? And when his, when his believers and unbelievers who are under demon influence, who are, uh, who are carnal, and our reversionist is the word we've been using, which is one of the theme uses, driving backwards, <clears throat> okay, is that they use that, same, they use that same ploy, okay, because that's how you seduce people. That's how you seduce people in a doctrine, okay? Because, and the whole point of that is what? What speaks for God, the person or the Word of God? The Word of God, that's right. So always understand that, is that if I say something that's not consistent with the Word of God, then I am wrong, okay? <clears throat> it is the Word of God that every believer and every single person, no matter what position they have, is accountable to. Everybody, okay? So this is how she gets away with it. So the question you have to ask yourself is that somebody who teaches, which she does, and somebody who seduces with their teaching, which she does, how do they pull that off? And they pull it off by moving you off a doctrinal thing, but bringing you to an angel of light thing. Okay? Don't be so ungracious. Don't be so legalistic. Those are the words you'll hear when somebody wants to move you in some place. Okay? Not that, not that, not that uh, legalism isn't real, it is, but it has a biblical context to it. Okay? Um, and it says here um, that she seduces my servants to fornicate, and that's to have sex, and to eat uh, food uh, sacrifice uh, to idols. So the, the important part here is that what she is doing is that she is overcome as a teacher, and as a, as a believer, okay? Um, she is a believer in the church of Thyatira, and um, one of the things that we have here, in fact, I want to, um, I'll get to it in a second, <clears throat> is to note her position, okay? She is a teacher in the Church of Thyatira. She is teaching, okay? Um, and before I get into that, I want to talk about doctrinal responsibility because there is a leadership. Everybody has a doctrinal responsibility. The difference is with pastors and teachers and deacons is that they have, a, they have their own responsibility but they also have a doctrinal responsibility and volitional responsibility for the positions that they hold. Okay? So what we're going to see here is we're going to see both of them because they both exist. Okay? If you can't separate one from the other, you're, you're missing a point. Okay? Um, so it's the doctrine of volitional responsibility, and we'll get it in the next verse. But I want to make you aware of it that there's two of them, that, the, that a pastor or a teacher or a deacon has not just their own volitional responsibility, but their position has a volitional responsibility. Okay? So, keep that in mind because it's how things slip through over here. Um, also note here, <coughs> this is really an important piece. Remember the verse where it says, at the top of this where it says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerated. Now, what's not brought up in that you is, did I mark it down here? Let me see if I was smart enough to mark it down. Apparently I didn't. Right so, huh? The U here, I'm just going to show you what it is. It's the word S. You have it right there. Oh. Underneath, Angle. right here. Oh, right here. Good. Okay, good. Well, I already, I already did all this work. Okay, so the word <laughs> Sue here, this is Greek. It actually doesn't look like that, but it looks pretty close. It looks like this. Okay? And Sue is you, but it's in the genitive, which means ownership, and it's singular. Guess who he's talking to? Pastor. He's not talking to the church. 
Let's go back to the verse before. He says, um, two verses before, uh, and, to the, and to the pastor of the church of Thyatira, I write, okay? So he's chewing out the pastor in this verse, okay? Because you can look into the Greek, and guess what? It's not plural, it's singular, okay? It's, it's one person, okay? So he's chewing out the pastor here. This is what he holds against the pastor, is, what he, is what's in this verse right here. This is his responsibility, okay? Um, and what it means there is that he had a responsibility to deal with it. Now, what didn't he do? So let's look into what he, what he didn't do. And, and, and it's, important to, it's important to know how it happens. But in reality, um, this sounds strange, you don't actually have the right to judge a pastor or a deacon or a teacher. You have the responsibility to compare what they say to the Word of God. That is your responsibility. But to, if, if, an example is that if you don't like the pastor, you leave his church, okay? So some of these people should have left, I would think. Uh, or, or if you don't like it as a teacher, you leave. If you don't like it as a deacon, you leave. If you don't like it as a believer, you leave. You have a responsibility to weigh that, okay? That is personal. But you don't have a responsibility to do anything beyond that. You don't have a responsibility to judge them, to call them out. None of that stuff. That, that is wrong to do that with authority. Uh, it's, we, we've covered that before in the doctrine of authority, so you don't do it. So, but I'm, it's important to look at because it's shown here, Christ certainly has that responsibility, and um, there are some responsibilities around that, okay? But we'll get that to a second. So what did he do wrong, okay? So let's look at some of the things here. She calls herself a prophetess, okay? And that, that's a problem, okay? What does that violate? Um, church doctrine. Church doctrine says there are no prophetesses. Now, are there some of the age of Israel in, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels? Yeah, but that's the age of Israel, not the age of the church. We don't have any prophets. Okay? We don't have any prophetesses. Um, so I wrote that right here. There are none. Okay? So that's one thing. The other part is she's a teacher. Okay? Um, and, and, and that's a problem. And let, let me tell you why that's a problem. Because uh, it, and it's simple to discern here. It actually comes in 1 Timothy 2.12. Okay. And I'm going to read it right here. It says, um, this, is, this is Paul speaking to Timothy. And if you remember, this is church doctrine. Timothy, Paul is giving Timothy church doctrine. So he's talking to him. Paul is talking to Timothy as a pastor and the one who's going to do the pastoral epistles. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach, okay, or to have authority over a man. A woman must be silent, okay? And that silent part means that she must be silent to learn, okay? Um, this is why, this is why, um, because you can only learn when you're quiet, <laughs> That's what you do, right? If you, if you talk over the teacher or the pastor, nobody learns anything, okay? So, but the whole point is that he had a responsibility is that uh, to, she shouldn't have been a teacher, not just because of her doctrine, which he's responsible for, but because he gave her a position of teacher, a position of power and influence. Now, the, the, what, does she, what does she teach them to do? Is she has them being sexually immoral, okay? So I suggest the greatest possibility is that that's not, she's not teaching that to women, she's teaching that to men. So she's violating this principle because uh, us men, we, we, we seem to be a lot more curious and interested in sex. Okay? Not that women aren't, I'm not going to go that far. But teaching sexual immorality is a, is a part of the, the phallic cult. It's a part of Gnosticism, it's a part of the Nicolaitans. Okay? Um, it, it, is a, um, it is actually a worship of demons. In the sense that she is teaching it, uh, it's a worship of demons. In reality, is whenever you take sex outside of marriage, which is, it, which is its only context. There's not a second context. Okay? Um, when, you, when you take it out of it, you will always degenerate to other sexual deviant behavior. Always. It will end up leading to homosexuality, bestiality, 
it always leads that direction. And it always starts with one thing. It's like when we talked about last week. It starts with one thing that's a twist of doctrine. And we find that in the second piece. The second piece is the food um, sacrificed to idols. Now, do you remember what Paul talked about in the food sacrificed to idols? What he, what he said about it is that, you know, is that we all know, mature believers know, that food sacrificed to idols doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It's just food, okay? Not that a Christian, even most of the food they bought in the marketplace, you could buy it cheaper if it, were, if, it were, um, if it came out of the temple and it was sacrificed to idols. And remember Paul sits there and says, be careful when you eat food uh, sacrificed to idols in front of other believers who are um, less mature believers. Because if it means something to them, they're going to look at you and say, how can you do that? Okay? So... It, it, it's called the um, it's called um, the doctrine of liberty. You give up the doctrine, even though we as believers have a, a a complete right to eat food, sacrifice to idols or not, meat, generally speaking. Um, we, when we're with other believers who are weaker, we need to be very careful not to do that. Why? We 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 actually sacrifice our freedom so that we watch out for them not accidentally being spun out because of it and somehow hindering their spiritual growth, okay? You can see that she, she not only has no part in that, or she, doesn't, she does not observe that, uh, but it also goes to the point with the first piece of being part of the, the doctrine of worship of demons, okay? Because even Paul calls it out, I think it's in Corinthians, where he calls out that this is really what that worship is. When you, when you have meat sacrificed to idols, it's really sacrificed to demons, okay? That's, that's what, be, be, behind every idol is demon worship, okay? That's a doctrinal principle. So what happens is you see a uh, woman in leadership violation, you see the doctrinal violation, you see another, looks like a simpler one, but it is the one that is the one that twists, okay? So if you look at the violations here, they're all violations very clearly in the Word of God, Yet, whoever was the pastor of this church in Thyatira did not take care of that. He allowed it. And because of that, um, to his church, his church strayed. Okay? It, has, um, it has believers in it who are actively uh, sexually immoral as part of the teaching of this teacher, uh, Jezebel. Calling her Jezebel. Okay? So, um, let me see. So, my whole point in that is that it helps us see that when you, when you twist a doctrine or you, or you don't adhere to a doctrine, what happens as you get out of that is evil comes out of it. Okay? And sometimes the original evil is not sinister. Okay? It's just, it's undoctrinal. It violates Bible doctrine. Okay? And not, we've learned this before, not all evil is sinister. Some evil just violates Bible doctrine and therefore falls under the thinking of Satan. Okay? And what that leads to, in this case, ultimately leads to actual sin, uh, immorality. And we don't, we don't get any privy to how deep that is. But what we do know is that the name that Christ has chosen in this, um, in this address to the Church of Thyatira is the name Jezebel. And we know that Jezebel uh, was the one who led both the worship of, of Baal, okay? We learned this about, about um, four weeks ago. Baal and Asherah, O R, uh, I think it's O T H. Uh, Asherah. This is the male god. This is the female god. Okay, but their worship was different. This one included a lot of homosexuality and bestiality, and this one included everything else, um, lesbianism, so on. So what she was teaching them, she was moving them to accepting this. Okay, and we've seen that we 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 view that as very bizarre in our Christian 
um, thing, but a lot of the reason we, we, we observe it as being um, really, really off is because of this country actually was significantly lined up with the Puritans, who were completely the opposite. But in the land that they're in, in Turkey, uh, in um, uh, Anatolia, which is where they're at, this was very common. Okay, So for them, this was common as not what we think of. This was common as religious worship. This is what you did in the, in, as, a, as, a, um, as a pagan. This is what you did as your worship. This is the world they came from. So it's a stretch for us, but it's not a stretch for them. Okay, Because this, the world was, was like that. In our country, our country is going this way, right? This is what you're seeing going on in the country right now. What do we see? Homosexuality is perfectly acceptable. In fact, it's actually you'll get chastised for saying anything differently. Lesbianism, perfectly acceptable. What are you seeing now? Child, child pornography, and you're seeing, uh, it's called pederasty. You're seeing, um, um, what is the word for that? Pedophile. Pedophile, thank you. Yeah, I knew this word. You see pedophilia as being acceptable in our country today, for the first time, okay? And this will go worse, because what you're seeing is that you're seeing it come in here, and you're seeing when, you, when, the, when Christians don't do what they're supposed to be, light of the world, this is the part that you'll see. You will see it become more and more acceptable. You will see um, pedophilia become common in the next 10 years, unless this country changes around, okay? So you can see how it changes. First it was homosexuality, then it was lesbianism, then now you see this, it's, it's going to get worse. All this stuff's going to come back in. So, um, so it, it tells us that this is the stuff, the reason we know this is the stuff that, that they were practicing, these Christians were practicing it, is because of the name that Jesus assigns to Jezebel, to that Christian teacher within the church. So you can see that there's many things here that should have been stopped, but in reality, they were, they were allowed. They were allowed to exist in the church, and they were known to exist. Okay? And it starts by skewing a doctrine. It's because when you skew a doctrine, you introduce an evil, and then that evil changes other things. Because we, I, I suspect, you look at it like I do, is you look at it and you go, how could this happen in a church? How is this possible? Okay, especially in view of the fact that you also see mature believers in this in the, in the verse before. So there's mature believers in this church. Okay, uh, I suspect that's because they can't go to any other church, but they are still the ones who are. Even though this pastor is giving some good doctrine. Okay, now, Timothy allowed some of this kind of stuff in his church. Okay, in Ephesus. That's why. That's why. Um, Paul chews him out in 1 Timothy. He allows it because he's not, um, he doesn't take his authority correctly, okay? And his authority correctly would be that to take this gal out and say, wait a minute, when you're not teaching, you're not teaching any men in your class. And you know, uh, Jeannie teaches, but she'll never allow a man in her class. And she's very focused on that being very much womanly type things which is allowed if you read Titus chapter 1. Okay? So these are the things that should have immediately flagged them to deal with it. But whoever the pastor is in this church, um, he's, not, he's not dealing with it. And because of that, it, it, um, it becomes what it is, which is um, uh, evil, a great evil. Verse 21, he says, I have given her time to repent, of her immorality, but she is unwilling. And the translation is pretty close. It says, And so I, Jesus Christ, gave her, Jezebel, time that she may change her mind. It means to reorient herself. Okay? Back to Bible doctrine. Uh, Nevertheless, she did not wish to change her mind about fornication. What does that tell us about her? It tells us that she's a believer. How do we know she's a believer? This is, a, this is a significant point. How do we know that Jezebel, who's teaching these things, is a believer? It's because what the Lord says right here. I gave her time to confess, to repent. Okay? 
that's what you do when a believer, and you, and you know this is true, because this is one of the doctrines that we have, it's very strong. There's two pieces to it, and it's down here. Can anybody see it? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's grace before judgment. Okay? Who do you give grace before judgment to? Okay? What are they, what, what's the Lord asking her to do? Is confess. Confess your sins. Okay? Confess. That's the word metanoieo, and it's the same word we use for repent. It means to change your mind. Okay? When you are dealing with an unbeliever, okay? What is the first instruction that you give them, and Christ would follow that, what would it be? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? What do you give to a believer? Repent. Right? You never tell an unbeliever to repent. Okay? You don't tell an unbeliever to repent. Okay? Not with respect. You, you tell them to repent with respect to who Christ is, Okay? You tell them that. Who do you think Christ is? He's a good man. No, no, he's not a good man. He's the Christ. Repent. Change your mind. Okay? That's what an unbeliever instruction gets according to the scriptures. A believer confesses what? Sin. 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 Unbelievers are never told to confess sin. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. God doesn't listen to them. Right? There's only one thing that God listens to from an unbeliever. What is that? Believe on the Lord Jesus, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other message. That's why when, you, when you're evangelizing, you should never talk about a person changing their lifestyle. God, it doesn't make any difference with their lifestyle. They're condemned. The wrath of God's on them. What they need to do is change their viewpoint about who Christ is. Okay? So that's how we know that. Why is that important? Why is that significant? Because a lot of people will look at somebody who is immoral and they will think that they are not saved. And that is an incorrect position. In reality, that is not true. There are plenty of immoral Christians. Okay? This gal right here. Okay? We saw David do it. We saw many people do it. We've seen many believers be immoral and do wrong things. We talked about Balaam doing it last week. Okay? So we know that can a believer be really, really, really immoral? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay? What does that mean? That means they're out of fellowship. That means they're going towards the way of evil. Evil controls their mentality. It controls their life. It's their viewpoint. Are they saved? Yeah. How do you get saved? Believe in Christ one time? You're saved. Because what God does is perfect and forever. Okay? He, he can't change. That's the part we, look, we read a couple weeks ago is that God, Christ, cannot be, Christ cannot, cannot be unfaithful to himself. When he, when we can be unfaithful to him, but he can't be unfaithful to us. That's what that verse is talking about. And also the other piece here is that he is actually giving her, even though this sin, I'll say crime is big, he's giving her grace, okay, before judgment. This is another important principle, okay? Why is this important? Because many of us grew up in a legalistic house and many, many believers think that as soon as they do something wrong, God's going to come up and smack them, you know, kill them. Ha! Caught you! Finally! <laughs> you did something wrong. And we can see that that is absolutely not true. The God we have is a God of grace. He always has grace before judgment, okay? And you can see from this gal went a long ways down that road, and God has not taken her out yet, okay, as the time of this right here. And it also tells you that she chooses against, he, she, he's actually saying, she, to repent of her immorality, okay? Um, but she is unwilling, so it already knows her, her uh, outlook. The important part of this part is that even though we're one of these people up here, we've allowed this stuff, what do we do to fix it? Repent. Go to the doctrine. Go to the doctrine that is the orienting part. What is the, what is the part of our lives is that you don't think like yourself, you think like the Lord. And where do you get that thinking from? Bible doctrine. If you are not steeped in doctrine, you will not understand one principle from the other. And you will make, you will make human viewpoint decisions, 
but in reality, and you will be responsible for those decisions, and you'll get the outcome of those decisions, okay? So volitional responsibility is that if he lets this, if the pastor, and we don't know the answer to this, whether this happened, but it does tell us that she never repented. Whether he threw her out or not um, is something we don't know, but we do know that it will destroy his church. It's already a cancer in his church. It's already having people doing things that are sexually immoral and enticing others to do that. And I imagine violating many other things too. It also tells us, um, uh, let's, let's go to the, oh, <clears throat> verse 22. Let's go to the next verse so we can see what happens here. It says, so I, Jesus Christ, will cast her on a bed of suffering. And remember what I was telling you last time is that that's a joke. Okay, it's called a paradigmasia. It means that there's a joke in here. Is that where do, where does the immoral woman spend all of her time in doing bed. her malady in, in bed. bed? And so, what does the Lord use? I will cast her on a bed of suffering. This bed will be one of suffering. <laughs> okay. And the important part about that is that this is actually a. If I put it up here, this is actually. Oh, I see. Right, I did. It's divine judgment. This is beside. Um, it's not, this is not the result, there's two sufferings that you have, okay? One of them is that you get a suffering because you make a bad decision, okay? Um, that's a natural consequence. Whether you're a believer or you're, um, it's, it's called a natural consequence, okay? It's a suffering that you, that you feel, but it's not divine suffering, okay? It's a natural consequence, okay? An example would be, if I am like this woman here, what she has found is she has gone for pleasure, but she has found no satisfaction. She has found no contentment. She is a person who, uh, and this is where nymphomania comes from, and other things like that, both the male and female version of it, is that you cannot get enough sex to make yourself feel better. You, 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 you feel the pleasure, and even that diminishes, but what happens is you, you don't get the satisfaction. So what happens is you want more. It's like a drug addict. When we talked about this years ago, this exact same principle is one that one of the natural consequences of doing this is that it's not satisfying. Okay? Not. It, it, it becomes insatiable. Okay? You, you, it's, like a, it's like a hunger you can't feed. Okay? That is a natural consequence of violating the principles of God. But that is not divine discipline. Okay? That's not. This is the same thing as that if I decide to uh, eat the... What's those new donuts that are coming here? Oh, Krispy Kreme. If I decide to eat Krispy Kremes, a dozen Krispy Kremes every day, I will become fat. Okay? I will become huge. And it will probably kill me. That is a natural consequence of a bad decision. Okay? But that will not bring on divine discipline. Okay? So what I'm saying here is that you can make a lot of... What happens is sometimes people make a bad decision from a... I'll say from a non-doctrinal orientation. They make a decision, they quit a job, they don't like their boss, it goes on and on and on, and then they go, we don't have any money, now I have to take a job I don't like. They have a million reasons. Those aren't divine discipline. That's a natural consequence of being stupid. Okay? And these are, this, is, this is always happens first. Divine discipline, which he's talking about here, comes later. Okay? And that this divine discipline, whatever it's going to be, is going to come later. And we'll see there's two pieces to it. It'll come after this. Uh, and he says, hey, I'll put her on a bed of suffering, which means she's going to suffer in some way, and it's going to be a major suffering. And I will make those... Um, who commit adultery, and that word actually isn't adultery, that word is fornication, okay? Um, adultery is not a good translation because adultery, well actually technically adultery actually means all fornication, technically, but we don't use it in that sense. We always use it like I, I had an adulterous affair with uh, on my wife or my husband, okay? But in this case, it's talking about fornication and it's talking about the part we're talking about with Baal and with Asherah, and the failing cult, okay? That's the fornication he's talking to, 
talking about because that's the context. Okay, it's the same word as the, as the verse before. Um, and he says, I, I will make those who commit adultery or fornication with her suffer intensely, okay, unless they repent of her ways. Okay, so they're giving, they are also believers. He is also telling them to confess with the same solution. The truth is, is that if they were to confess and change, their life would get better. Uh, it doesn't mean that their husband or wife would ever trust them. It, it means it's a long road back. Okay, uh, when you confess something, this is the difference between sin and evil is that when you confess, and this is God's way, Bible doctrine, okay? Bible doctrine, direction. So you confess, you go from being uh, sexually immoral to being back to God. You make that confession, you change your mind, you do it, you go back to Bible doctrine. Your sin is taken care of, but the evil still has consequences, okay? And what that does to you is it means that that's not an easy transition. You've made this transition, but, and there's a piece in Peter we talked about years ago that talked about that, is that the evil thinking is the part that's the hard part. Getting that out of your head as a way of conducting yourself is very, very difficult. It takes years to do this. Okay? Years. You may confess the sin, and you've been taken care of. You will have to... Go back to those verses before, you will have to persevere in the Holy Spirit and persevere in Bible doctrine continually to get out of that so that evil does not possess you, possess your, your soul, your mentality. Does that make sense? So, but he's giving them the same, he's giving them the exact same choice. This is the part that shows us doctrinal volitional responsibility. You are responsible for your environment, you're responsible for your decisions, you're responsible for your success and your failures, okay, as a Christian. Um, promiscuity, and the note I had is promiscuity, which is when you are sexually immoral and you follow that fornication, you will not find any happiness, you will find pleasure that will diminish, and you will ultimately find original gratification, but no gratification, and you'll be in what um, is called the um, search for happiness. You'll be, you'll be frantic search. the frantic search for happiness. I was trying to see what that word was. The frantic search for happiness, and you will suffer even greater. Um, verse twenty-three, he says, "I will strike her children dead." Now, this isn't talking about her biological children. This is talking about the, the people who are in her class. So he's saying, if they do not change, I will bring them unto the sin unto death. And it will be a horrible suffering death. Do Christians su suffer horrible deaths? You bet they do. Especially when they, when they go to the sin on div of a divine discipline. There's, there's many believers who when they walk with God, we saw this weekend, where they have that peace that takes them over into, into eternity with Christ. The believers who are over here have a horrible death, okay? They, they, from the time that this starts, their death is horrible and it is suffering until they die, okay? And then the best thing that happens to them is die. they die. <laughs> and they immediately become happy as soon as they cross over, just like that. Um... Okay, and then it says, it says, I will strike her children dead, meaning those, those are her followers who are following her teaching. He said, then all the churches will know. Why all the churches? Because God, the Lord Jesus Christ, wants to teach the pastor and the other churches that you cannot do this in my church. I will deal with it, and I will deal with those individuals. You have made him know him when he was a sweet little a Christian person, and when he converted and he started going off the thing, I will show you what suffering looks like, and they will know that I am God. <laughs> okay? So, um, I think that's kind of cool. He says, um, I am he who searches the hearts and minds. So this is, this is a good, good principle too. We know this. This is the omniscience of God. It means that one of the greatest things you can remember is that God can see every thought you have, everything you do. And... Uh, there is no hiding it 
you just deal with it. When you have a relationship with them, if you can't deal with something, ask for his help. Whenever you say yes to a decision, remember right here, whenever you say yes to this decision that God wants you to, God's power becomes available for you to conquer it. That power is Holy Spirit, Bible doctrine. Ooh, I'm really late here, huh? Yeah. Uh-oh. Um, yeah, and it says here, and I will pray each of you according to your deeds. Now, this part right here, the context is that this is negative, okay? But the other context is positive, right? And that's the part we're looking for. We're looking for the positive side. Verse 24, and now I say to the rest of you, the believers who are maturing, in the first verse where we had the positive, in Thyatira, to you who do not hold on to her teaching, that's a qualification of what she does, the others, and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. What are the deep secrets of Satan? That's the doctrine of demons. Okay, That's liberal enlightenment. You don't understand. The Lord has shown this to me. Okay, You see these idiots on television all the time. That is the doctrine of demons. Okay, That is the deep secrets that he's talking about here. He says, I will not impose any other burden on you. And he's talking about the positive ones. It means that you keep on doing, you keep on following these steps. Okay, And this will bring you to maturity. Why? Because you're your maturity and the things that you do will get greater and greater and greater. So that's what he's saying to them. Uh, only hold on to what you have until I come. Okay? And this is, um, this is the rapture. So we can see there's a double parallel here, not just to Thyatira, but to ourselves. Okay? And he means hold on to what? Hold on to what is he holding on to? This. Bible doctrine. That's right. Bible doctrine and Bible protocol. And then, he, then he, in verse 26, it says, To him who overcomes and does my will to the end. Okay? Overcome is nakao. That's the mature believer. They are the overcomers. We know that from every, every one of these churches, there's overcomers. And that's what these people are. Nakao. <clears throat> and does it to my, and to the end. What end? The end of their life. Okay? You are a person finishing a goal. Okay? The goal does not stop 10 yards before the finish line. This goal starts at the end. And one person used to be in this class who used to always ask me, well, God wouldn't take that away from us, would it, just because we didn't? Yeah, he does. That's right. He does take your gift away from you. If you don't finish the race, you don't get it. You don't even get the yellow ribbon. Okay? You do not finish. You don't get a participation trophy? No, yeah, Jesus does not give participation trophies. Okay? <laughs> Um, he says, I will give authority over nations. So he's telling us to, to those people who persevere, who finish that race, who go to the end of spiritual maturity, um, accomplishing the works of God in their life and in the plan for them. He will give them authority. That's for us as believers. And then he, verse 27, this is just a qualifying verse that talks about who Jesus is in the millennium. And he, this is, in fact, remember this is a quote from Psalm 2, 8 through 9, and Jesus is quoting this about himself. I will rule them in the millennium with an iron scepter, that means absolute authority, and I will dash them, which means instant punishment, uh, instant divine discipline, unlike our time, um, mostly at a national level, and I will, break the, I will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I receive the authority from my Father. So he gets that delegating authority. The last piece, which uh, is such a small little piece, but is actually one of the greatest lines in Scripture. He says, I will also give them the morning star. And the morning star is the, um, is the award to those who are the Nakao. It's the, I think it's probably the highest award for those who are faithful to the very end. And that he promises this is the highest positional uh, next to the, um, the crown of life. And then the last part, he ends with everything. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And, and that is a doctrinal dictate, is that the Holy Spirit is the true teacher of the Word of God, but he teaches the Word of God. So, that's it. That was a lot. But <laughs> so, note that, that he held them responsible. 
The wall of fire is available to these because they do what God asked them to. They are all responsible, okay? Nobody gets out of this, okay? The ones who choose rightly, they're here. Ones who choose wrongly, they're here. Um, 